Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lessons of Europe. I'm your host, Hal Mokalova, and right now we, we need to talk about this old house. For security reasons, the press had not been allowed in. In fact, the room was dauntingly empty with just some security personnel, a few diplomats from both parties, and Schmidt and the American president sitting together at the table, most likely Bennett. While all of the details of the treaty that would be signed had already been sorted out, Schmidt was understandably still stressed about this evening. This moment was not to be taken lightly. Small talk was made until the food arrived. The main entree was a succulent, mouth-watering, roasted goose, and Schmidt could, simply couldn't help himself. I suppose you could say the goose is cooked. Schmidt's English was very good, but he hadn't gotten a full grasp of this particular idiom. Surprisingly, it got a genuine chuckle from the president, perhaps because he simply appreciated Schmidt's attempt. But from then on, it was, it was as if the air had cleared, and friendly, amicable conversation proceeded as if the two had known each other forever. Later, on a very full stomach... Schmidt and the president went out before the sea of reporters and staffers to sign the document officially ending the embargo between the U.S. and Germany. If we can't kill each other, we might as well trade, no? Cracked Schmidt, getting plenty of laughs and despite the unfortunate degree of truth buried in the joke. Two lasting cooperation between the two nations. Now, right now, we are trying to finish up this one. If you want to read this again, please go ahead. I have actually not yet done uh, finishing off, at least, future perfect. If you want to read about that again, please go right ahead. And which I probably will go ahead and do at least one more of these off screen. High rank speed does not look great, but we'll go with Salvage Wunderwaffe Designs. The last years before a certain dude's death saw the failed development of the Wunderwaffe projects. Gargantuan, unbelievable weapons which, in the eyes of the main proponent, Hermann Göring, would have magically annihilated all the enemies of the Reich. Exploiting the other dude's senile conditions, and with the support of the powerful military, he wasted an incredible amount of money desperately trying to make them work. Of course, they never did. When our agents captured the laboratories dedicated to the Wunderwaffen, they captured the blueprints of several theoretical designs and even some prototypes failed, of course, and brought them to us. We'll, of course, get rid of everything, as our resources can surely be better spent on more productive research, but some of those studies show promise. Some of their theories about electronics and energy propagation could be what our scientists need to make a breakthrough. As they say, waste not, want not. Cool. Right now, we also need to come down here as well. Um, we'll probably do the KWG. It's only... 7 day focus. So, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft of the Forderung der Wissenschaft, or Kaiser Wilhelm Society, was founded back in 1911, when her people had a completely different vision of what Germany's future would be. Ever since its inception, the society served as a countrywide neural web, a hub for research in all fields of human ingenuity, with separate branches tending to be different projects. When the Civil War began, the society was fragmented, its efforts concentrated on war, but now the times were ripe for a return to the original focus by reconstituting. Constituting the detached branches in surviving universities and encouraging remaining academics to join them will both resume an honorable and historical tradition and give a strong boost to our research efficiency. Now, right now, we don't have a lot of command power, we're, we don't have a lot of political power, but that's just because I actually finished off Poland. Um, actually, it still looks like there's a ton of uh, indentured servants here that have no recourse of hope for freedom, but. We're still over here, and we got to finish this last one off. So this way, cartels still have no influence. And this, these guys are down to 14 million. And it looks like about 82% of our workforce is still there. But soon enough, we will have a better industrial equipment. So I'll see you in just a little bit. And here we are at my friends. Right now, we are not doing any focus because there's a sea of blue that we can see right here. And actually, um, we just finished off this one too. There's still a lot of uh, slaverinos here and such, but uh, yeah, the cartels are out of power. Which is great. 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 Which means it's time for Führer Erlass. They thought themselves invincible, unstoppable, above the rule of law and the nation's justice. They thought wrong. Aji Farben is on its knees, brought low by decisive action with the might of the Reich government. With Hitler gone and the reactionaries disempowered, power, they can no longer hide behind the skirts of the military industrial complex. Let this be a testament to our resolve in pursuit of a more righteous world. It's time to strike the killing blow. Obbs and his council of rats are scrambling to consolidate what little they have left and flee the Reich. This cannot be allowed to happen, Herr Speer. It is a dictator with unquestioned authority, and it's past time he exercise it, thankfully. He is entirely on board with the idea of bringing down the hammer as in a dramatic, fa dramatic a fashion as possible. What better method than to order the immediate and indefinite arrest of Hermann Josef Obbs on charges of high treason? Let's see the dude charm his way out of this one. Very, very good. Now, we can't quite dismantle him. Oh, uh, which is weird that, uh... Are we missing anything here? I mean, maybe... Uh, Bessarabia, but... Other than that, I mean, yeah, we still have some slaves, but... We're getting rid of these guys, so... Um... We want to read about him again. There we go. We got some comments uh, happen as well. Comments to happen? Comments to read. Such as... Um... When will the slave revolt begin? Apparently the slave revolt will begin in next year, 71. But before then, I think we have the oil crisis we have to deal with first, so we definitely have to do that. Uh, such as Sabir we're doing, and, and I did get Egypt under as well, like I think I said like earlier, so... 
Not too bad. Really, really not too bad at all. Uh, let's see. What's my favorite TNO German unifier? I have no idea. I haven't played Goring yet, so I don't want to give any opinions yet, really. Spear so far has been difficult in the early game, but I'm actually really enjoying this now. Um, Hadrich was always fun. I've done him twice. I've done Bor Borman, which is okay. Borman's okay, but Vox Axin. I've done it for the first time in nearly 40 years. Germany's economy is free. The cartels are dismantled. Their executives on the run. Their wealth in their hands. Once again, the entrepreneur can innovate or start up a business without being coerced into selling out. The working man can earn decent wages in a healthy work environment. And most importantly of all, the slaves will suffer and die no longer at the whims of cruel overseers and soulless men in suits. The only issue that remains is that of corporate assets acquired by the state. Our continued ownership will only lower their profitability and potential. We should sell them off to the Mittelstand on the cheap and be rid of them as soon as possible so they don't continue sponging up our money. Hopefully this initiative, let's call it Volksaxin, as nice, that's nice and patriotic, will have the Mittelstand putting them to better use than their old owners. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. It is 1970, so just have to be careful about what happens here. Another comment was... I have funny German pronunciations, yeah, I mean, I took German in high school and college, but it doesn't mean I remember a lot of it, so I try my best at saying German names and stuff, but obviously, I'm not a native German speaker, so we don't need this one anymore, so, yeah, not too bad. Um, still 13 and a half million, that's way too many, but it's alright, we're doing the best we can, we're doing absolutely the best we can, uh, let's see, so one says, it makes a lot of sense for us to support authoritarian socialists in the Middle East, yes. Well, just because we don't like Italy. That's literally the only reason why, so. He's authoritarian democrats, authoritarian socialist, and authoritarian socialist, so. The enemy of my enemy might be my friend, depending on the day and how we're feeling. And if we had lunch or not, so. Um, let's see. Anything else here? Anything else here? No, those are for neutral conservative. We are strongly reformist right now. And here, here, here. Uh, Morgenzon. Yes. Seeing Vogel has been a success. Having established a foothold in Thailand, we can launch a more ambitious project. The R&D will begin a direct probe into Japan proper. We have no real knowledge of how strong the intelligence agency is, so the risk is unknown. The rewards, however, can be very high depending on what we can uncover, so it should be very good to do. All for all, at least must be reformists for us. This is the one, if you want to read this one, please go ahead. Um, this is if we can't get this one done, but obviously we can do for all. With all the corporate assets we've seized and sold in recent months, we've accumulated quite a healthy liquid reserve. I foresee such potential in this. Infrastructure, welfare, education, public works, the Wehrmacht, we have enough to fund whatever we so please. The last time we received an influx of capital was during the days of the war economy, when the hail was looted and pillaged like a pack of barbarians, and we all know where that led us. With that in mind, I believe we have the perfect thing to invest in the Zolverein. Our member states are painfully under-industrialized, impoverished, and backwards. As a leader of the Customs Union and the foremost economy of Europe, it is our responsibility to offer direct economic aid. <laughs> My apologies about that. There's a certain justice in using the ill gotten gains of slavery to heal the nations from whence these unfortunate souls were stolen. Perhaps in time, this will soothe the wounds of war. Money can't buy happiness, but it can buy the means. <laughs> My apologies about that. My cat wanted to leave the room. So, very cool. Vox Axin. Ludwig Erhard felt happy that for once it seemed like things were looking up for Germany, and not in a way that needed the deaths of non-Germans, or the working to death of slaves and their labor contributing to a rotting economy. No, 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 no. Now that was going to be a thing of the past, something to be looked at in shame. At least, he hoped that that's how history would retreat it. Whatever road it would go didn't matter in the moment, however, as he looked over an analysis of who owned what in the Einheit Pact. A chuckle escaped his lips as he took a puff from his cigar before entire regions of Germany and its partners would be shaded in solid colors by now. Now only one color dominated the battlefield, and those four me mega corporations that were left were reduced to nothing but small dots and sometimes even stripes to indicate conflicted ownership. Staring at a map for a moment longer, Erhard nodded to himself. With his economics plan put into full force, he knew that the people, most importantly the middle class, would thrive from this change of pace. When Erhard eventually left his office, he took a slight detour and made sure to pass where Speer was currently residing, just to take a look at the man's expression. With only a quick stop by the door, he could glance at the man's shuffling papers, his face showing only uncertainty. Erhard felt satisfied with what he saw, and left before Speer could notice the minister laying about. With another puff of the cigar, Erhard smiled to himself, I am far from finished, Herr Speer, far from finished. And made in Deutschland. Look, that's a beautiful icon. I always knew we'd succeed. Only a cynic or one who does not understand economics would ever have objected to the measures undertaken by my ministry. And objections there were, from the party, full full of small-minded men, and from the cartels bloated with the blood-soaked profits of slavery. Now they are silent. Germany rises, a great Lazarus, shaking off the ashes of the pyre it was consigned to by its own foolish leaders. The shackles of slavery lie shattered, not by the senseless violence of revolution, but by the precisely aimed hammer of economics backed by Christian virtue in that old German spirit. 
Huh. Made in Germany is no longer a mark of shame, but one of quality. Quality that comes from free labor. Fairly paid for. Quality that will become the new standard for Europe. Such are the fruits of freedom, of sound economic policy, and European friendship. May it be so forevermore. Also, the other couple of comments says, uh, minimum wage? Yeah. I don't know. Minimum wage? Mm hmm I don't know, I have differing thoughts on minimum wage. And also, apparently, I've always forgot about Hamburg and civilian uh, factories, so that's really weird that I always forgot about that. Because it's just so small. It's so small, you know? And it's also weird to see, like, oh, we have 12, or 12 factories here out of 8? That's not really good. And Vienna has, like, 22 out of 25, but we can't put any more in. But... Oh well! Embers of the past, Antonin's 50th birthday was today. These days were no different from any other though. Only a reminder that his body would continue to break down and become less useful and that his mind would dull with the passage of time for that morning. He brought a slightly worn out coat to work and passing by the checkpoint noticed an aura distinctly different to how it usually felt. When he entered the factory, Antonin noticed that all the workers were congregated into a half circle around a podium in the middle of the room. Fitting into the crowd of half Germans and half Poles, Antonin stared at the collection of what looked like military officers one standing in front of the rest. Subconsciously, greeting his teeth at the sight of a proper Nazi, Antonin listened in as a man gave a stiff salute, and then, workers of the Reich, in this case, I'm more importantly addressing our Polish slaves. Antonin rolled his eyes, of course. The Führer has announced that the Litzmannstadt automobile factory, property of Dalma Benz, is letting go of all Polish workers who have not been born in Litzmannstadt. Immediately, the murmuring in the crowd was heavy, but a slamming of rifles against the ground by nearby soldiers shut them, and Antonin nin up quickly. In fact, today, those in question... We'll be given three days' worth of rations, documents, including a passport, and one month's work of pay. You'll be guided to trains that'll head either to German territory or to the Polish government. Feeling a need to say no more, he gave another stiff salute. Dismissed. Antonin's mind had entered a flurry. What was God was what Gottfried said that year ago really going to ring true? Was he finally going to go home? Why now of all times and so suddenly? There was a tightness in his chest as he approached the men he had now known for two years, and for a moment he had looked at Gottfried as if he was just another German, but it passed just as quickly as it appeared. You, you were right, Antonin began, and his fellow worker nodded silently. Now I must board a train and head to a city, all in one day. This is all happening so quickly, so suddenly, and he trailed off. Gottfried shook his head. I don't know much, Antonin, but I know that I'll miss talking to you. Antonin looked at the German carefully, swallowing a lump in his throat. Perhaps, perhaps I will miss you too, but... Made in Deutschland. Here we go, my friends. We've done it. Ah, it had been a while since Erhard went and purchased a vehicle. Not since sometime in the 50s did he decide to invest his money in such a thing. But now, now we can do and do it knowing that he wouldn't have something looming over his head as he, mind, as he might. The vehicle in question was a Mercedes-Benz W108 vehicle. It was a few years old at this point and there were other choices available to him, but this car struck out or stuck out to him as pleasing to the eye, and as he rode in the streets of Germania, felt the quality of its build on the concrete shelves, shelves, streets. These cars weren't built with trembling slave hands. Instead, the design was constructed by a healthy, paid German, one who specifically studied and prepared for that sort of job. Not only that, this car he bought did not come from some far-reaching company that employed millions upon millions of slaves instead. It was by a factory sold off to a middle-class family at the behest of the government. And to really drive the point home, Erhard made sure that anything built by German hands alone would be specifically marked as being such. If his plan blossomed fully, that, mean, that would mean that eventually. That label would apply to every German product. Stepping out of the car into the parking lot, Erhard looked over the vehicle once again. This could be sold abroad, even fall into the hands of an American family that could appreciate German techno technic uh, technicality repurpose for more benevolent means. It was almost certain that Speer would look at him with a worried expression if he said that out loud, but at least he would consider the proposal of exporting German goods to beyond just the Einheit's pact. With the theorizing done with, Erhard began a service of the Reich that morning. Things needed to be doing. Things needed doing. Papers needed to be looked at, and there is a gang that must be tended to, traced by its big daddy, made in Germany. Less ideology to defense, way less defense, but foreign trade payments? Nice. And honestly, with that done, I mean, we still have a lot of slaves. It's still going down by quite a bit, but our, you know, path to abolition of slavery is going super well, and we've just dismantled the final corporation, my friends. I think that, for me personally, this is one of the biggest achievements of this campaign, to dismantle all four mega corporations. so I feel like we're done. I feel like we're done, but we're, obviously we're not done. So, um, up next, I do want to finish this stuff. I do want to, f oh, we did finish up the US tree, so this stuff can wait. Uh, we can get some more stability, but we don't really need it, honestly. So I already read this one, so if you want to read this one again, please go right ahead, but... It is what it is. And Supremacy or Bust. 
Our direct competitors already make great, making great progress in many fields of research. The Americana, Japanese, even the Italians are ahead of us. We cannot remain idle or bound by our own fear of the future. We need a great effort, one which will lead us towards new discoveries as soon as possible. By investing considerable amounts of resources, both financially and politically, into our finest research facilities, and our scientists will be able to at least partially fill out the gap with the rest of advanced nations of the Earth, until we can finally be on the same ground once more. We'll achieve supremacy or we'll fall trying. Forward for progress. Nice. Keep spending. 63 billion is so much. That GDP growth keeps going lower and lower. Flickering and fading. The wooden flooring made is behind sore, but it's not like he could complain. The train's car door in front of him was open, exposing the endless screen that swirled past him. He didn't know what to think. What was there to think? Nothing at all, indeed. That is what Antonin was going through. He thought of nothing, but his mind hurt as if it had a migraine. Perhaps he was not allowing his mind to think, yet to deepen that hole of nothingness and despair a thought was extracted. He could notice his breathing becoming more hitched, the scratching of his fingertips against the floor as his hand tightened up. I have been here before, the sentence wandered in his mind, numb and cold, but it held an ingrained sense of impossibly comprehensive. Fury. I have been here before, I repeated, begging to be completed. The rumblings of this engine and the mixing of the colors in front of me, I recognize this all. It's familiar to me in a way I cannot ever forget. And how could he? If he did, he would simply lose the last thing that made him a person. Otherwise, he would simply be a shell, hollow and tumbling in the void, waiting to be consumed by reality's cruel whims. I've been here before when I was, I never expected to be anywhere else, but I did, and now I've returned. Antonin was not thinking. How could he think? If he did, it would only open up long lost memories that he would not dare look at. Here in this train, he was alone. Utterly alone. In this train, there was nobody else but him. He had all reason to think, and all the time, but he would prefer to have his mind remain closed. Banishing the flame that threatened to engulf him in his mind, he only stared mindlessly into the fields, all of which blended into the same field, green and endless. Yet even in a lack of thought, he hated the chugging of the engine, the bumps in the rail making him stop up his breath as if the ride had ended. Silence dominated his surroundings, but all he could hear was noise that was almost 30 years overdue. He did not feel the pain in his fingertips, nor the fact that everything in his vision blended into shapeless blobs or whirlwinds of color, and the grinding in his mind that lasted for hours and hours and hours. A train in, a train out, one filled, one empty, and only I remain. Ag fob and dismantled. May I know the reason why you summoned me, Rex Minister? Ludwig Gerhard looked at his in interlocutor. So similar to him, and yet so different. Him and Yosef Abs was smoking the same brand of cigars, and his eyes mirrored Ehad's cold, calculating, messless eyeballs. This, however, was where the similarities ended. Unlike the president of IG Farben, the Reich's minister actually had ideals and this made the difference. I called you in order to notify you of the imminent dismantlement of IG Farben. It too will be broken up into its constituent companies, each to become a competitor in a free market economy. There he had dropped the bomb. He was prepared. Ob's would scream at him, the two would scream at each other until he would leave defeated. Therefore, it was difficult to reign in his surprise when he heard the rival's words. I see you, Reich's minister. Thank you for what you are doing for the Reich. Ehrhard's jaw dropped short of falling to the ground and Ob's chuckled. I can see your surprise, but your fears are unfounded. I know that you are trying to abolish slavery and build a new competitive Germany based around free market and positive competition. I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I'll tell you more. I have tried several times to reduce IG Falcon's reliance on slaves, but the others in the board of directors always objected, so I'm glad you took the initiative. Finally, with Erhard recovered from the shock enough to shake hands with Alves when he stated his need to participate to a board meeting. As soon as he was back on his stuffed chair, Erhard started reflecting upon what he had heard. Alves was lying. That was he was sure of. But why? What could it bring a man who had no qualms in sending thousands to their deaths for a couple million Reichsmachs to suddenly support the abolition of slavery? Something was wrong, but he couldn't put his head around it. The dude's plotting something. What is he up to? Victory, victory, victory. I like having victories. I hope you like victories as well. Supremacy, oh, bust. And they'll have a hiring spree as well. And a deutsche praxis tauschlichkeit. Hiring spree. Oh, what happened here? Federalist reconquer Iberia. Oh, hi, good job, guys. Oh, we have some more. Oh, the fifth research slot. That's not going to last very long. Um, 120 days. Well, 95 days. I want to maximize what do we have here. Is this 120? No, that is like longer than 120. That's 200 some. Anything down here instead? Maybe 48. Oh, we can use you twice. We can use you. Tw well, we. How many blueprints do we have for this? I don't know about that. It is 1970. Oh, we'll do engineers. Why not? We're going to lose it anyway. So. The Reich's, uh, the Reich Amts for Militär Forschung is rapidly expanding as it absorbs smaller, less efficient bureaus across various branches of the military administration. While well, a boom for research, this is taking more and more men from their duties, which is rather unwise given our precarious situation so soon after the end of the Civil War. In order to avoid a loss of efficiency, we shall grant the RFM its own personal and funds to recruit more. A hiring campaign will be launched across qualified members of the army, and as they join, they will be replaced in turn by new cadets and recruits replenishing our military. Never truly lost. <clears throat> oh, look at this, supremacy or bust. 
He still had a job to do as he always would, with the main difference was being that he was surrounded by men and women of his own blood, all of whom lacked a distinct armband that denoted them as poles. A symbol of oppression removed, but it meant nothing to him. In fact, it only served to further frustrate him. Every day after he would come home from work into a small apartment that could barely house one person, Antonin wonders what really would have happened now. Clearly, this was not the end goal that the Germans had attended for him, as Gottfried had implied. But what then? What else was in store for him and his people? One day, the pier shrieking of the whistle woke him from a daydream and started and loaded him to work. He was dreaming so often nowadays. Was that age or simply a want to escape reality? Either way, work was mon monotonous as before, only with somewhat less oversight from the guards who seemed willing to pounce on any opportunity to harass him before. If I had to carry on had, like this, perhaps it wouldn't be so awful. He had a place to live, a steady supply of people to talk to, as well as walking around the city freely, even if it was tamed by the Aryan and molded in its image. At least those illusions which lasted until a fellow worker spoke to him. Surprised to hear a voice, he observed to who spoke to him. It was a woman who seemed to be in her 40s. You, she began, with Antonin listening in only passively. I can tell that something is off with you. Like a pacified animal, you shamble around and wait to be put down. Is that right? That caught his attention immediately, and he hissed out. Are you ridiculous? What are you saying? What I am saying is this. I can sense that you are empty, my friend, that you have wanted something which has, kept, which has been kept from you for a long time. And what would that be? He silently struck back. Frustration already appearing on his face. An opportunity, she said, and a small smile graced her lips. An opportunity, Antonin repeated, the word echoing in his head. Was that not what he was looking for? In all those years of labor, he never once struck a German in fear that he would miss out on an opportunity. And now, to take back what we've been deserved for so long, you know, as well as I do, don't you? She asked, as if she was speaking of some long-lost artifact. Say it. That alien word has been stolen from us for decades. You offer me freedom. Oh, well, Germany is a technologically advanced nation, relatively speaking. Other major powers have taken the lead in cutting-edge science. Germany must regain its rightful place as a leading scientific power in the world. Must research industrial automation techniques before any of our competition beats us to it. Oh. Okay, that's interesting. Race for organization. Okay. Five, five. Okay, so I was actually fine waiting to get this one done first. Okay, interesting. And this one. You can say many things about us Germans, but not that we are impractical. As the research d deepens and achieves more and more breakthroughs, the most recent discoveries in the field of electronics and wireless communications are suited for a subtle approach to the matter of public security. Agents from the Reichnachrichtendienst have made contact with the Reichsamtsfeld Militärforschung, asking to be given the prototypes of these new technologies so they might implement them in their secret operations. Being able to spy without being seen or without being in the same building, sometimes even in the same city as those being spied, will tremendously help our secret services. Very good. Oh, we can't do that one yet, though. Oh, we need to get rid of this thing first, though. Okay, that's interesting. That is weird. Do we have a... Yeah, this one. Okay, that's fine. Um, well... Wait, we need construction five. How is... Wait, whoa! This is four. Well... Is this for future, maybe? Streamline automation techniques two? Enhance industrial administration. Holy crap! That's extremely far away. Whoa! I was not expecting that. Reich's umph for military recruitment, huh? So this will be removed in a few months. Okay, weekly map are going down. Okay. Alright, interesting. Well then, so we can't do that yet. I didn't realize it was that far. So we're done with this. We'll come back here. We're done with all this. We've got a lot of the focus you done. I, I feel pretty good about this. Hope you guys are feeling pretty good about it, too. We're not complicit. Well, we can do that, but an apology? Saving face. Look to the border. A trade agreement. How about this one? Uh, let's do an apology first. Maybe then we'll, maybe they'll like us more. Apology first. Perhaps the best way to start the negotiations would be an apology. Though the Atlanthropa Dam was in order by us, we are still their successors in accordance to the international law of continuation, which means that in the eyes of the Italian government, we are directly responsible for any damage caused by our predecessor's actions. By issuing an a public and official statement of apology, in which we express our regret for what the Italians suffered, we can show the delegation how sincere we are in mending the past, and start a new course for our new nations. We can only hope it works. All right. Yeah, holy crap, that's really far ahead in time. I just remembered, or kind of know that um, things might go really badly for us in the fu near future. So, how much artillery do we have? We don't have that much army XP, actually, so... Um, would we better do this, or just better make our panzers better? 18 combo with, and 3 or things, they're exactly the same. Well, these aren't quite the way I like them. These guys are actually 20 combo with, which is really nice. Yeah. Panzer division. Um, 4... Actually, you could throw in one more of these. That'd be actually better to get a little more organization for these guys. There you go. You can do that. And make sure that all you guys are that exact same type of division. Because you guys are not. Just because I want to make sure whatever military units we have will be okay for the future. So, goodbye. 
And you guys are 20 combo with, like we already established. And you guys are 18. Uh, I really don't want to send in other stuff. I'd rather have more artillery. I'll be honest. I would much rather have artillery. But infantry is pretty cheap. Yeah, it's really cheap. Holy crap. Yeah, I'll do that one. That's fine. As you can tell, we don't really have a lot of stuff here to work with. Not great. I don't want to get more army XP, though. And then, saving face. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's not do saving face. I want to do something else first. Let's, yeah, let's get some jet cast. That's better. Jet, better jet fighters or something like that. Look to the border, easing the tensions. Let's do this one first. The tensions of the last 20 years between the Pact and the Triumvirate can be seen in the fiscal borders between our countries. The Alps, which crown the mainland of Italy, act as their natural defensive and extensively fortified to prevent any aggression on our part. Bunkers, trenches, and airships dot the Italian Alps, often digging below the mountains to be able to launch surprise strikes from seemingly unreachable positions. Of course, our predecessors built their own defensive systems, and now our border... Uh, garrison stare angrily at each other from the two sides of the frontier. Until we ease our tensions, it'll be almost impossible to truly let go of the past and normalize relationships. A 30-year fury. Gregory had always carried the hate passed down from his father. There was a spirit in him, unconquered, unbroken, unwilling to bend to the will of that Aryan scum, but he had nothing to show for it, only working day by day to toy himself and serve as a slave to the Germans. Uh, if that's all he would be and remain to be, then it was almost better to simply cease to exist. The thought to grab the nearest metal object and rush a guard crossed his mind, but never in the years he was working there did he carry out that glorious fantasy, perhaps. He was a coward for doing so and always remained a coward, until one day. A sure boy stood tall over him and the rest of the non-Germans present in the factory. He didn't understand much of their language, choosing to almost act actively work against learning it, but once he had learned fragments of it, enough to learn and piece together one cruel fact, that the first German worker would come work here beginning that shift. Even though the silence afterwards spoke for itself, the guards didn't motion for any increased vigilance instead. They seemed to show relief that their fellow brethren would work here. Gregory, however, had other ideas. Only minutes afterwards did the first workers begin trickling in, and once he did, the light in his eyes had shone in a way previously unknown. He could tell what the sinking with this, what the sinking yet exciting feeling in his gut was. This was a time he could get no other time, perhaps. It was a fact that the guards were relaxed from the German workers. Perhaps the other Russians and Poles and Ukrainians decided to ignore the fact that Gregory seemed to, be, to tense up, as if he'd seen the murder. And perhaps the Germans was approaching him mistook the feelings as fear rather than fury. What was for certain, however, was a chaos that ensued when Gregory grabbed the nearest metal object, screamed in a voice coarse and unused, rage overfilling every inch of his body as it swung harder than he'd ever swung before. The sickening crack that echoed throughout the factory was quickly drowned out by shouts and bootsteps, with a German falling to the ground like a puppet with a string cut as Gregory unrelentingly continued. It took no less than six men to tear the murderous machine away from the man bleeding profusely on the floor, and only minutes later did the sons come over the factory once again. When tomorrow arrived, there was one less slave working in the factory. Just an industrial accident. Well, if things like that happen, you know how to deal with that, right? Publicly, uh, have a show. We'll put it like that. Publicly have a show. Mm, things happen. Things happen. Uh, we can do all this stuff. It doesn't even matter, though. It really doesn't even matter at this point. And we're trying to invest in ourselves again, so we're looking pretty good. I mean, without the micro corporations hovering over us right now, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Until things just fall apart again, because they, they always will. Apologizing for our actions. At the same time, in both Germany and Italy, the Gross Deutsche Rundfunk and the Telegornal RAI gave a simultaneous broadcast on all channels. The Führer of the GGR, Albert Speer, should now release an official statement dest destined to the government of the Italian Empire. Came the smooth voice of the German announcer that with Italian subtitles. And after a few seconds, a camera passed to the Reichskanzlei in the Führer's representation office. There, behind an ornate desk with an eagle-shaped golden inkwell at its center, the ink spot pots. Safely tucked under its wings sat Speer himself. For a moment, a shadow of hesitation passed over his otherwise serious face, only to disappear as soon as his eyes focused on the camera. Then he spoke, subtitles following his words. Citizens of the Italian Empire, perhaps you may have forgotten, but we were once allies. Against an enemy ten times superior, we stood side by side, our bond of brotherhood tested in fire and blood from the icy steppes of Russia to the fiery desert storms of the Sahara. A moment of pause, again a, a small hesitation, and then its expression became one of contrition. However, our alliance came to an end after the unwise actions of our country. My predecessor, Ill advised by the corrupt members of his administration, chief among them, Hermann Goring and Botten Bollmann, ordered the construction of what would become known as the Alanthropa Dam. We all know what would uh, <clears throat> the results in the beautiful cities of Venice, Genoa, and Naples bear the scars of a mistake as Adolf Hitler's successor. The responsibility of such shameful and irresponsible conduct, which can't be simply excused by this advanced age and progressing illness, falls upon me, and for this I am sorry. Another small pause, another long hesitation, then he looked directly at the camera and said in a heavily accented tone, he spoke the crucial words, Mi dispiace." Perdonatemi se potata. The camera went dark, and the anchorman's smooth voice resonated once more. Well, that was all. We thank you for your attention, and bid you a pleasant evening. All the Reich asks for the talent people is for forgiveness. We just blow them up, probably, honestly. 
easing the tensions. Despite our initial talks, tensions with Italy remain high and their delegation is cordially yet firmly refusing to proceed to more substantial aspects until all wrongs are righted, which of course is a veiled way to demand further concessions. Our apology, they argue, is a good start, but it serves no practical purpose and will not bring the sea back to Genoa, Venice, and Livorno. Now we're in the uncomfortable position of having to choose whether to give in to their demands or not, and as if yes, in what measure? The Italians want facts, no words, but we are truly ready to prostrate ourselves before them. Just for the sake of a treaty, perhaps we could simply grant them minor concessions, which should already satisfy the diplomats to some degree and prevent protests in our own country. On to Nehmen Morgenson report. Japan, leader of the co-prosperity sphere, said as other Japanese military. Above all else, the main issue that currently faces Japan is its own military. Having successfully infiltrated agents into low-level positions, we have uncovered that the IJA is facing issues with massive discontent in its ranks. With powerful influence, it is at odds with the other branches of the government, and threatens national stability. The situation seems unlikely to change for the time being. The government is ineffective with giving a response. Discontent with seems with, within seems to be rising with the current status quo. Future developments have no clear way of developing expected outcomes. Status quo resulting in decay of the state power. Purging of military, massive decline in stability, military continues to grow, political turmoil. Japan is unlikely to recover from the situation within the next few years, end of page. No, so powerful as previously thought. Good. You can do it anyways, because I don't really care. Any other unique missions we can do here? If not, then we'll just do stuff in here in Europe. No, no. And we can't do either one of these two, so we've pretty much done all the missions as well, so... I guess we'll do some satellites? I guess we might as well, right? Um, now it's starting to feel just a little bit empty here. As you can see, we're building up a lot of cities in our, uh, puppets, basically. Like, we are really investing in our former conquered territory, so... Hey, man, Speer means it when we're building in our allies. Looking to the border? Easing the tensions? So our southern border. If we were, if we're, one were to travel to the border between the GGR and the Italian Empire, no matter where he came from, he would immediately notice several road dis roads disparting, or departing from the main ar artery, even though there are no towns or villages signaled. If taken by sudden curiosity, if he were to climb one such road, he'd find his desire for knowledge abruptly ended by bright signals bearing them under his mistakeable Militarische Sicherheitsbericht, Unbefutigs Bretretten Verboten or Zona Militar Accesso Vitato. If for one to see such signs, he would turn his car immediately and forget about any curiosity, for unbeknownst to him, he would already be in the scope of a sniper belonging to the elite German Gebergs Brigade or the equally elite Italian Alpini, following his every move as he leaves what is in truth one of the most heavily militarized regions on the earth. When the Ala Trumpa disaster struck, the Mediterranean nations, Italy, Iberia, and Turkey left the Axis in a rage and established a triumvirate. Immediately, the new alliance prepared to defend against what would later become the Einheit's Pact. All mountain borders, from the Balkans to the Pyrenees, were fortified by none so much as the Alps. The frontier between the Italian Empire and what was once Austria is a single gargantuan fortification spanning more than 200 kilometers. Bunkers, pillboxes, and trenches, sheltered walkways dot the Dolomiti. And while the icy peaks may seem pristine to the casual observer, they hide deep underground galleries and ammo depots, and the anti-aircraft positions encased under the mountains, like a cursed mirror reflecting the evil within the hearts of men, identical defenses can be seen on the German side. In the end, the German attack never came, and the Reich collapsed under its own weight like a clay-footed Goliath, but the fortifications remain, and even now, thousands of Italians and Germans look at each other from the ramparts, the ingenuity of such fortifications only surpassed by the hate they were built with, as if the very concrete echoed the feeling of betrayal and anger of the Italian people. Ever since the times of Hannibal, the Alps defend Italy from its enemies. Saving face. While our apologies have been welcomed by the Italian delegation as a good start through the talks, they haven't been appreciated by the conservatives in the government, not one bit. Now our own supporters criticize Schmidt, the man responsible or the main main responsibility for diplomatic overtures to the Italian Empire, accusing him of having sold out our national pride in this humiliating charade. If we want to avoid problems at home, we need to find a way to save face at once. While not turning back on our apologies, we, we, which would only infuriate the Italians, we'll start a propaganda campaign about how important this will be for our national security and our economy in the long run. Not bad. Anything up here? Nope. Cool. And easing tensions. Well, we we will be saving face, but we should be able to do this one soon. 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 Very very soon, actually. When this one is done, we'll actually be able to do it, which is nice. We don't have a lot of manpower, but that's okay. Uh, do we need to train some more? Yeah, we do. Do we definitely, 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 definitely need to train? There we go. That's what we like to see. Let me go and read this one again, please go ahead. This is really good to get done. Root out resistance mission effects. Nice. How far should we go? As our delegation has agreed to grant concessions to the Italians in the future treaties between our countries, we now face internal indecision on the actual size of such concessions as the various factions within the government try to convince with fear. 
writes Minister Schmidt and his followers agree that we should show the full extent of our goodwill and try to convince the Italians that we truly want to build an entirely new relationship with them. The Conservatives, on the other hand, refuse to humiliate the Reich by granting the Italian Empire the upper hand and insist for token concessions which will nonetheless please their delegation. Finally, the Führer himself is trying to act as a mediator and not could find a middle ground in his substantial concessions but nothing major. Still, the arguments from all sides are very convincing. The matter is now in the leader's hands. In what direction will the helmsmen decide to steer ship? Conservatives? The Führer finds middle ground? In the end, the reformers convince the Führer? Oh, yeah, pretty much. We'll do that one. I don't like giving up national pride and stuff, but... For this part of the campaign, well, whatever. Military applicability. While our most recent discoveries are extremely promising, we shouldn't forget that wars in the end are still fought by soldiers with rifles, tanks, and airplanes. The most modern technologies can't help you if you lose on the field and your capital gets occupied by the enemy. In order to help our men in the future wars, we need to slightly shift the focus in the, of the RM, RFM so that it properly starts researching modern weapons and equipment which will return our army to its former glory. Pretty good. Pretty smart. Or pretty much what is expected. Anything down here yet? Nope. We have 13... Civis infrastructure. Good, good, good. Prepare until infrastructure. The Reich Nach Wechtensdienst has, has expressed a keen interest in new advancements made by our research and has requested that prototypes to be streamlined and mass produced. As a matter of fact, they're suggesting to create an entire infrastructure dedicated to storing, sharing, and transmitting secret information. This service, which they have called Netzram, while still a dream for now, would allow for the rapid transmission and the completely safe storing of all of our military secrets, and even for more efficient ways to keep potential enemies or terrorists under control. As the Führer has expressed a keen interest on this project, we shall oversee the preparations of this great endeavor. We have a lot of people which I think we'll need for the future. Bring Netsram online. We are finally ready. After long and expensive preparations, everything is ready to bring the first long-distance information service online. By transmitting a data file through Netsram between two distant facilities, we should not only prove our superior ingenuity, but also inaugurate a new age for the Reich. With Netsram, Germany finally stands proud among the modern nations of the Earth once more. No longer shall the German people look in envy as the world leaves us behind. No longer shall their peers laugh at us for being outdated. No longer shall the Vaterland built under the weight of its own inefficiencies. Praise our great Führer, for he has brought us into the future. Better computing, counterintelligence is good, decryption power is great, cryptology level, very good. So this stuff is all done. Oh, I'm going to go straight for that one next. Max Netzenam. Good. Oh, do we have something here too? Or was it over here? So hopefully we have enough dates for this one. I kind of doubt we do... Um, I forget how many days we spent on that last one, but whatever. Just, uh, you know what? Screw it. We'll go with something easy. Is it 866? We can try that one. I don't know. We might get that one down, but whatever. All right, not too bad. And then saving face we'll do next, and then a trade agreement probably. Approaching the Swiss. Everyone, calm down. Well, that's a lot of PP there. That's a lot of PP. Token compensation. National debt will rise. Thaw and relations would probably be pretty good to do. Anything else over here? Yes. Yes. And we have 100. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I knew it was going to happen. Have we done enough of this already? Yes, yes, we've done enough of this already. Oh, crap. Please let me get Nesrom done at least. We still have more than enough free cities. Oh, but no, we don't. Finally, but this happens as soon as Oil Crescent starts. Oh, my goodness. This is so bad for us. Oh, this is going to be so bad. Oh, it's going to be so bad. Uh, if you look, I mean, I've been building. I, like, as you see. We are heavily, heavily investing in our allies. Oh, why are you doing that? Huh, very weird. Don't need to waste stuff like that. Oh, look at all that. Oh, I missed a strip here. But even the roads. Like, the roads. Like, we have an Autobahn that's unmatched by anybody in the world. Even America probably doesn't have, an, doesn't have good enough roads like this. Crap, 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 crap. The oil crisis, no! Oh, nothing can, go, can come out of this. I want to finish the last focus before we... I don't know if the focus rate changes, but we'll see. So, civilian budget. Oh boy. 94 billion? 121 billion? Oh my god! Choking on black gold. Well, choke up, I guess. Um, heavy aircraft. Air refueling. Jesus Christ, that's so much debt. So much of a deficit. Hey, but our GDP is still better than. Uh, our national debt, so... Choking on black gold. Dietrich slowly doused the cigarette from his mouth into the ashtray with a shaky hand. He'd been running on empty for the past 28 hours, the worst 20 he's ever had experience in his life. Ever since he'd woken up, anxiety shot through him like a hailstorm of bullets. With the situation escalating in the Middle East, he heard that it was better to start selling his stocks in the oil industry now to avoid becoming penniless. 
Being the risky contrarian that he was, Dietrich decided against going what common sense and insider information had told him. That everything would generally be fine with the German economy, some bombs sure, but never anything crippling. Until he received an anal analytics report back from the Frankfurt stock market, its index. He saw the graph crash downwards first before the number, and he popped some pain relief pills to subdue the severe headache he got. All of his investments were practically wiped out since so many others got out and sold what they had. He was left with a pitiful amount of Reichsmarks to make back. Everything that he built up over the years gone in an instant. God help the Reich, the Sir Oil certainly won't. This is not good. Oh, regime stability decreased by 30%, so be it. Oh, look at that. I haven't seen this. With the oil crisis and its economic effects rippling through the world, the GGR was hit particularly bad by it, as the Frankfurt Stock Exchange dropped by over 100 points. Thousands have already been laid off, and several businesses appear on the road of insolvency. Economists were quick to note that the Reich's dependency on oil massively increased due to the vast industrialization efforts under the Zollverein, particularly in Eastern Europe, which we were literally doing. Fuhrer Speer has yet to publicly react to this crisis. If economic reform was the main pillar of his reform policy, the abrupt fizzling out of the so-called Wehrwachtswunde that took shape under the guidance of the Reichswehrschafts uh, minister Ludwig Erhard is sure to take a massive toll on public approval. Netzram is online, though. After several years of preparations, repairs, tweaks, and improvements, finally Netzram is online and fully operative. This new and incredibly advanced system, linking together all computers in the most important research facilities and government bureaus all throughout the Reich, allow for the incredibly fast transmission of any sort of data from text to images, tra dramatically improving coordination between the various institutions. While well, Netzerum's main purpose is to help scientific research and increase bureaucratic efficiency, few doubt that the Fuhrer will experiment with its use in the fields of military espionage. After that, who knows, perhaps the system can be expanded and adapted for civilian use? Still one thing is certain, with this achievement, the Reich has finally entered the future. Crap. And I knew the focus you would change, which was why I was trying to beeline through the mega corporation stuff earlier. Achilles' heel struck, and we thought we had it all. For the first time in decades, the Reich's future had seemed bright, the economy was on the up. Civil strife was at a low, and the people's confidence in the government was unparalleled since the days of Hitler. It only takes a breeze to set the whole house of cards wobbling, however, and the winds of change are blowing. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and the oil crisis has hit us where it hurts, the economy. Sudden shortages have halted the flow of capital material, and prices on the Frankfurt stock market have plummeted to levels unseen since the 50s. We aren't the only nation left scrambling, and fuel shortages mean international trade has become prohibitively expensive. If we want to drag ourselves out of this hole, it's going to be by our own efforts. The hot bleeds. The crisis is taking its toll. Countless businesses have closed their doors indefinitely, and the employment or the unemployed, have started to fill the streets. Where only days ago Germans would have believed they were in the middle of a golden age, now the, the government has to do something, anything to stop the spiraling situation. They demand work, food, aid for the family, something to show that the Reich has not returned to the disaster of the 50s or even the heck that was a Weimar Republic. The Reich's art arteries have been cut and its blood is spilling across Europe. It shows no sign of stopping. Alright, so what do we got here? Obviously, there's stuff up north. Uh, oh, stability is at 70%. Um, we can still do stuff there if we really need it. We might need it. I'm not really sure. We're going to do this stuff as well, too. The Reich in crisis. The oil crisis has made the social tension in the Reich reach a boiling point. As it's over and economically collapses, the people embark on the protest against the party and for liberalization. Getting both the people as well as the economy back under control quickly is of the almost importance. Collapsing? Rebellious. Improving the economy inevitably comes at the cost of polarizing society even more. But without such improvements, Germany is bound for a catastrophe. Strike the companies. Huh. Wefer schafft Führers. Uh, Netzrum comes to life. As all lights in Germany were pointed at the Universität Göttingen, in a secluded room deep in the bowels of the electronics research wing, dozens of engineers, academics, and simple students were crowded together around a large machine. By their expressions and excited comments, one would think that they resembled children waiting their turn to enter a bakery shop, and in a way, indeed, they were. A large machine stood in the middle of the room, towering over the simple people at a human level. A small screen and a keyboard were encased in the metal, a screen had nothing on it, but soon it would change. In a very similar room in Germania, the central hub of Netstrom had been activated. The network spanning the entirety of the Reich was officially active. In a few moments, a message would arrive from the main device, and the results of this first test would show whether the experiment had been a resounding success or a humiliating failure. The screen buzzed with life, and everyone almost turned into a giraffe trying to look down at the screen. Letter after letter, it appeared. What is your name? Cheers erupted across the room, with, and with trembling hands, the university dean answered, Walt, Walter Bertha. Another few seconds, and then a second message, What is your quest? To which the agreed-upon answer, To further science. Finally, the third and last, What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Silence fell in the room. This wasn't the correct question. Was there a problem, a bug, a hacker? Then a student asked for permission to write, and once he had it, he quickly wrote, An African or a European swallow. Two min ten minutes of tense wait, waiting, until the screen finally buzzed again, Scheisse. Cheers and laughs erupted once more. A great day for Germany. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's great right now, but the West cowers. The Western Zolverein 
Eastern, the Eastern Screams. Eastern Europe is burning. Having only recently obtained independence, a largely German-owned industry from Krakow to Moscow is still focused on the exports of goods to the Reich. With a lack of buyers and sudden diesel shortages destroying both supply and demand, the economies have faulted or halted with the graces of a crashing freight train. Exacerbating the problem are the millions of repatriated slaves suddenly left jobless and homeless. What little goodwill we have earned with their freedom has been annihilated as we take to the streets, as they take to the streets, riding against both their former German masters and the countrymen lucky enough to have maintained their freedom. The ongoing economic crisis is rapidly becoming a societal one, and without intervention this may be the blow that finally kills German dominion over the East. Declare martial law. Oh crap. The cooperation of the KWGNs. With the end of the joint research program, the scientists and academics from the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft have returned to their ordinary activities. As the government research agencies opened in full, there was no longer the need to rely on an esteemed but still external academic institution. The closing ceremony was held at the Reichskanzlei, where the Führer had held a formal dinner which she saw the participation of dozens of important researchers from the KWG. The host complimented the scientists on their results, expressing his great appreciation for the progress made in the fields of electronics and industry, of engineering and military. With a keen intellect and your selfless dedication to the Reich, he stated in a speech at the end of the banquet, you not only ensure the Vaterland's greatness and the continuation of the dream of National Socialism, which should already be a satisfying reward for true patriots such as yourselves, with, with what you have done, and you looked at the entire room, you gave a new hope to the people by ensuring they can live better lives with, to help the, with the help of technology, and you ensured our brave soldiers can truly protect us from any danger both inside and outside our beautiful nation. As the fear sat down, a polite applause from the guests showed their appreciation for the compliments, and the ceremony ended with a confirmment of the Deutsche National Preis for Kunst und Wissenschaft, the highest decoration for scientific progress to Adolf Friedrich Butenand, director of the society. Whilst this cooperation is now over, no one can deny that its roots will still be felt many years from now on. A toast to a science and progress. Oh. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, so declare martial law. Social tension improves much better. The rate by which social tension increases every two weeks increases drastically. You get more stability. Conservative causes significantly benefits from this costing us so much stability. Things are getting very out of hand in the Reich. Demonstrations against the government swell through the streets, buoyed by millions of unemployed workers and former slaves. Treason and sedition is quickly winding through the furious masses. These riots are becoming an existential threat for our government. Our last resort must be used martial law, sending the head to break in the citizenry and restore order. The people will despise us for it, and our reputation will be greatly tarnished, but the Reich cannot be allowed to fail in its darkest hour. The heart bleeds. Take to the streets. Dito's throat was hoarse from yelling, but he yelled all the same. His arms ached from waving his placard, hastily scrawled in anger as he saw the procession marching through the streets, yet he still held it high. His feet were sore from trampling the cobbles all day, but he still stood surrounded by the other men of what had become one which had once been his office. They had received the news of the collapse from the Frankfurt stock market this morning, and it only been a matter of hours before his boss had in hands, had informed him that the firm had been dissolved. He hadn't believed it, not until the building security had escorted him out. Now they were on the streets. All he could see in every direction were men just like him must see people informed their services were no longer required. The streets before the Colonel Rothaus were flooded with light, illuminating the roiling mass of people demanding the government do something, anything to alleviate their woes. A sliver of him pitied whoever was inside. The rest of him wanted to see them dragged out, tarred and feathered. His brother and Akin had been laid off as well. His wife's family in Baden-Baden had got into a fistfight with their landlord when he demanded rent in advance. Well, it was such a crime to, help demand, to demand help from the government, the government that had caused this disaster. They were being beaten and bloody for the sin of wanting food to eat. A root to sleep under. A government that cared. No more. Uh, that's not good. Uh, the rate by social tension increases every two weeks becomes somewhat increased. Wait, so increases social tension? That doesn't sound very good. Distribute propaganda? It sounds like um, everything here, or at least these two, these are really bad for us. So, um, implement economic reforms. We are ready to implement them. Um... Strike the companies. We probably wouldn't do that one, but... Distributed propaganda. Propaganda has been an integral part of the Reich ever since its inception. Propaganda has helped the Reich through many trying times before, and it will do so again by beginning a massive propaganda campaign. Extolling the achievements of the NSDAP and the bright future which lies past these troubled times, we should hopefully stave off the growing level of discontent that is warming through the people. Yeah, I think that's the only one we can really do here, I'll be honest. This one seems okay, and this one seems good to do as well eventually, but... With extreme prejudice, Heinrich's baton connected with the rider's face with a sickening crunch, and he fell to the floor. Stepping over the limp body, he forced his shield forward, breaking the nose of another face contorted with rage. Behind him, his tightly packed comrades stepped over the previous figure, uncaring for where their boots landed. Now that they had room to make any consideration for his comfort, like a hoplite phalanx, the weight of the men behind them kept them facing the enemy ahead. His orders had been suppressed the ride at any cost, and he was glad of the leeway granted him. Without it, he would likely be dead. 
The scene reminded him of nothing more than the student protest which had taken place before Hitler's death. Ahead of him was a sea of screaming faces, waving placards, sticks, and bats. Rocks were flying through the air, raining down on his helmet like a hailstorm. He had been there for hours, pushing, shoving, lashing out with a baton that had taken so much punishment that the wood was starting to splinter. He thrust it forwards, and a woman screamed as it dove into her eye. She fell back into the crowd, and any remorse Heinrich might have felt was suppressed by panic as the rioters pressed forward and his shield was pushed against his chest. He couldn't breathe, ex exhaling, but unable to inhale, he was being crushed. His panic was relieved by the, by the his of tear gas, by the use of tear gas canisters flying over his head. The roar of the crowd turned to screeching and coughing, and Dietrich's breath returned. He slammed his shield forward, and the front of riders fell apart, revealing the crowd had collapsed, stumbling blindly back from the clouds of gas. He fumbled at his belt and pulled on his mask. He raised his arm and charged forward. His baton connected with the rider's face with a sickening crunch. Only violence can suppress violence. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Cool. Anything else? Oh, this one probably should help us out a little bit more, right? Um, this one. Anything else here? Cool. Well, we'll do the best we can. The hot bleeds. Black, red, and gold. The TV crackled and fizzled with static. Pietro scowled and smacked it in the viewers all, but it was, this was not the 5 o'clock news. Heavy bags hung under his eyes, but the look on his face was one of triumph instead of immaculate hair of the usual presenter. The man looked tired instead of the polished set. Behind this man was a simple tricolor black, red, and gold. He glanced past the camera, looking for some confirmation. Are we live? Good, good. He returned his gaze to the camera and grinned, shuffling his notes. Peoples of Germany, things are bad. I don't have to tell you that. Everyone's out of work or losing their job. The Reichsmark buys a penny's worth. There are riots in the streets. And we sit watching our TVs while some newscaster tells us that today the Orpel killed 15 people in the name of peace. Like that's the way it's supposed to be. This government doesn't give a crap about you. It only cares about enriching itself or funneling money to those corrupt dudes at IG Fabin. Well, even though... We probably made it public that we were going to dismantle IG Fabin anyways. Things are bad, worse than bad, they're crazy. We sit in the house while everything is getting worse and say, Please, just let me have my TV that was made by some poor pole on a penny's wages. Leave me alone. Well, not leaving you alone, I want you to get mad. Get mad about the oil crisis and the stock market crash and the Cold War and the murders committed by our government every day. I want you to say I'm a human being, gosh darn it, my life has value. I want you to go out into the streets and cause things that aren't going to change until you get mad. I want you to go out there and shout, I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. Get up out of your chairs and go to the window and let the government know. I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. Peter got out of his chair and opened the window. People were yelling. He put on his coat, opened the door, walked out into the streets, and he opened his mouth. I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. I mean, honestly, like, it's an oil crisis. What do you expect? I mean, I mean, I get it. Like, you know, people want the government to actually do stuff, but like, I mean, we could just probably just send direct. A Can we send direct aid to the Iraqis? Can we send yeah, we can. That should probably be very useful for us. We should probably do that. Good luck, guys. We're going to need it. Well, at least having some sort of conflict down here. All right, send up to 40. God dang it. Well, yeah, just like yesterday. All right. Both of you. Oh, it's only... Oh, crap. I, uh, 30, I went 20. Fine. Cool. Both of you get down here now and do that. Cool. Well, that sucks for everybody. Um, there we go. Heart bleeds. Cartel public meetings. Tension, social tension improves moderately. Um, no. Distribute propaganda. That's pretty much what, probably all we're going to do. 28 catastrophic collapsing. It is what it is. Eastern screams. Followed up with the West... Cowards. While the Western members of the Zollverein are not as intrinsically linked to Germany as the East is, they too have been hit hard by the ongoing crisis. Their more independent economies are crumbling under the pressure, facing similar problems of mass unemployment and plummeting stock prices to the Rose of the Reich. Belts are being tightened across Western Europe, and governments are implementing rapid ro programs of austerity, slashing budgets and implementing wide spending cuts. Unfortunately, that includes their con contributions to the Zollverein. Another avenue of credit has been cut off to us, and it is becoming increasingly clear that we must deal with this crisis ourselves. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, 76% is not too bad. I don't really want to do that one. This one's fine with us. Um, National Socialism increase. Nah, not worth it. Mm, bribe enemies? Why not? Increase commitment? Seize oh, look at this one. Arabs will not like this. Our involvement will decrease by 5. Or Z's will... Oh, gosh. Um, and th I mean, that makes sense. But it doesn't say it's going to um, improve our oil crisis effects or national spirit. So, Georgian of the Grave. 
The fear paced back and forth between the briefing room. He'd borrowed one of Schmidt's cigarettes. It was only one of the few things that seemed to calm his nerves nowadays. Galen was pre uh, prevaricating about the protests and riots that were rapidly spreading across Germany. What had started as a series of demonstrations among laid-off workers was rapidly expanding into the crisis all of its own. Protests have been reported in every major city of the Metropolitan Reich. The number of demonstrators has been rapidly increasing over the past few days. My informants import report that the demographic has changed from a majority of redundant working men to contain students, laborers, even housewives. There's commies, liberals, Reichsbanner, even the Hitler Youth has reported groups absconding to join the protests. Their demands range from handouts to government-responsored housing to the complete replacement of the current regime. Galen's sunglasses concealed his eyes, but one could see the furrow brow above them that indicated his worry. Speer wished he'd taken the stupid things off just once. Von Tresco raised a voice. Wehrmacht units have been brought in to assess the Oppo, who are increasingly resorting to violence to suppress the riots. The protesters, too, are improv improvising weapons, and several dozen officers have already been murdered. Stacks, stocks of tear gas and rubber bullets are running low, however, and production is all but halted under the circumstances. If they aren't brought to heel soon, I worry that units might resort to using live rounds on the rioters. By contrast to Galen, who maintained his blank sunglass stare. Chesko looked downright, disturbed by the prospect. Speer kept his, kept, just kept pacing. He needed another cigarette. Can they win the fight for peace, or will they disappear? Authorized uh, significant thing in there, huh? Um, involvement will increase. Can I lower my involvement? Hmm, it's not too bad. Not really worth it though. Increase commitment now. We're okay. Yeah, I don't really care. All those are okay. I mean, they're fine, but we know whatever. Um, 76%. I want to keep an eye on this because I want to get the stuff done as fast as possible. There you go. Nice. A little bit of conflict. Cool. They didn't have a lot of organization. Of course, they were training before they left, but whatever. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure who we're going to kill off, but let's go over here first, maybe. A little bit of lag, that's okay. We'll get the planes going over there first. Oh, they're already here. Nice. Can you guys win here? They, they are 20 combo with, so there you go. Yay! God, I love helicopters so much, man. Snake in the grass. Gunter Grass stared at the front of his front door and from the inside. Outside, people were protesting. He'd been out to see the spectacle, joined in on the shouting, it felt good. He spent years writing, denouncing the regime in pseudonym. His works have been highly acclaimed in the literary circles, quietly, of course. It didn't do it, it didn't do to publicly proclaim your appreciation excuse me, your appreciation for subversive literature. His works had even been smuggled out of the Reich, and apparently were highly acclaimed as subversive literature written by a subversive. He'd been proud. One could only be so proud of a work that did not even bear your name. His underground activities had put him in contact with the Reichsbanner, and he had wholeheartedly devoted himself to their cause, writing pamphlets and cyclicals, for fomenting revolution from his desk. Yet still, his name was a secret known only to a few trusted contacts within the organization, despite his writing spreading across the Reich from east to west that was soon to change. Outside that door was one of the Reichsbanner's journalists and a cameraman. With a few pictures and an interview, the world would know of another of the author of the Tin Drum of Dog Years and Cat and Mouse, his chronicles of Germany's decline and fall under national socialism. All of Germany would know his name. The Reichs Nacht Richtungsdienst would know his name. They could, he could be dead very soon. He opened the door and the journalist raised his hand. Are you ready, Herr Grass? It is time to wipe out the brown scum. Okay, no no growth now. That's, that's not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. We're still building in Hamburg, though. It's nice. 4 and 11, huh? Are we supposed to do that stuff like right now? Because I just, I just don't know. The law you can trust. We were just protesting, not rioting. We never touched the police, never even approached the barricade. We had a few placards, rehearsed, or chants, that's all. It lasted an hour, maybe until the Orpo reinforcements arrived. That, then they left the barricade and attacked. No calls or dispersed, no warning at all. Rick, Rickard von Weizsäcker's office had been flooded with new clients to the extent that it looked more like a hospital than a law office. Just glancing out of the corner of his eye, he could count two broken arms, a neck brace, and more black eyes than he'd ever seen. The woman before him looked more like she'd just left a car accident than a peaceful protest. He scrawled a few notes before returning his attention to her. And your husband is still in custody? Has he been charged? They won't tell me. He, they won't even let me see him. They just say he'll face trial soon. We don't have much since he was laid off, but I'll pay anything to see him released. Her face was stricken with fear, and she leaned forward in her chair, eyes pleading. Ricard signed. That won't be easy or necessary, Frau Schwartz. I'll, I'll take your husband's case pro bono, and her confused expression, he refused for free. Frau Schwartz's eyes teared up, and she exclaimed her thanks repeatedly. He did his best to hurry her along without seeming too dismissive, and informed her he, she would receive his call soon. Once she was out of the door, he rubbed his tired eyes. His practice had usually been busy, but this was beyond p the pale. The violence the government was inflicting upon its own people was ludicrous. He forgo his next meal the ending wanton abuse by this foul regime. He tried to do his part with the von dem Bush's little plot to kill Hitler back in the day, but if he couldn't bring them down by extra-legal means, he had resolved to do it by legal ones. He picked up the phone to the receptionist to send in the next one. Um, I mean... Technically, these guys are the riders, so, like, I get it, like, people are, are probably starving in the streets, but still, like, what can, what can you do at that point? 
What can you literally do? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Just cutting him off is always good. Six, anarchic. Vas sein muss. We have wasted valuable time flapping our arms in confusion. We must act. An emergency conference must be called in in order to decide a response to the crisis. I feel spared as part of the reform. The gang of four will come together in an emergency session and chart the course the Reich must follow through these deadly waters. What must stay and what must be jettisoned in order to keep the Reich afloat? There's already one particularly large money hole which has been eyed up, eyed to be sealed up. But would sealing this fissure simply create another in the quarters of power? Maybe. Maybe. Just maybe. Can you guys actually win here? That'd be great if you actually take Baghdad. Mother Russia bleeds. But if you'd like to read about better expertise, please go right ahead. Excellent. <clears throat> Shona surveyed the map of Moscow before him. The protest that the Fuhrer and his weakness had allowed to overtake Germany proper since it he, since spread far into the east. Throughout the Baltic, Ukraine, and Poland, Speer's yes man and collaborators had dialed in dealing with the treason and was consuming the once peaceful cities of the Reich, issuing demands for unearned rights or even the overthrow of the local National Socialist Party. Alexis von Roen had instructed him to follow a similar course, allowing dissent to fester among the Slavs like a rot. Von Roen had apparently not grasped that without propping up from Germania, he was a figurehead. The true power in Muscovy was concentrated in the hands of the men with the rifles. The protesters had been allowed to concentrate in Friedrichsplatz, what the natives had once called the Red Square. Schooner appreciated the irony thus far, he instructed that the protesters go unmolested, that as many of the rats would be drawn out as possible. To von Roen's eyes thus far, he had complied with orders, now it was time to dispose of Dispose of him of his illusion of control. Ferdinand nodded to the adjutant, who had been lurking by the door, waiting for just a signal. Upon the map, he had carefully marked a series of streets to be barricaded. Now that the protesters had been contained within the kettle, the barricades would be pushed forward. The tanks would roll down to Friedrich's plots. The pressure in the kettle would rise, and within it, traders would boil. For one day, Friedrich's plots would become, again, red. Time to announce the failure of Spia's methods. Even though we're, we actually have so much stuff to build here, um, I've, I've even built up a lot of things here too, so, yeah, we'll see. Having a nuclear east is probably really bad, bad, bad idea. Look at all that. There you go, cool. Um, I guess we can build a lot more airports, I guess. I don't know, we'll see what happens. I have a good feeling that we're not going to be able to keep all this stuff for now. It's probably going to be a big old revolt or something. Probably not very good for us. And build in Poland, build all over there, build all over the place here, too, so we don't have to do this for a while. Until I deal with it off screen, probably. So, not too bad. Yeah, this is not turning into a good situation for us, I guess. Oh, wow, zero? Social tension improves. Increases every two weeks, somewhat. Martial law. Um, increases every two weeks. Yeah, we don't do that one. Let them riot, I guess. You know, let them burn themselves out. Oh, uh, look at that one. Look at that one, too. Hmm, anything down here I really care about? Not really, no. Boss sign moose. That's next. I'll be taking Baghdad. Give us the oil. How fast can we move through here? So fast we can take the capital, maybe? Maybe. That'd be kind of cool, actually. Extraction. We're still maxed out on fuel, which is nice. And they're done. We won! Fast sein muss. I was going to say, like, wir muss. But at this victory in Iraq. Let us hope and wait for the best. Nice. And our party popularity is what? Eh, 77.9% is not too bad. Oh, we're not, we're not spending anything? Oh, that was the other thing that wasn't doing. Okay, that's fine. We got... We, have, we can do that one. That's fine. 4 and 0. Uh, sein muss. Was sein muss. Muss sein. A preliminary decision has been made. Hard times call for harder decisions, and it takes hard men to make those decisions. Some might call it callous or cruel, but it takes little to criticize and everything to act. This decision is made not for the Fuhrer, but for his, or for his ministers in the King of War. Not for the party or even for the Reich. This is a decision that must ensure the safety of all of Europe, lest the continental system we have worked so hard to maintain comes crumbling down. We will hold our heads high when the people throw their insults and insights at this most dire of choices, for we know that what in that in the end. It will all be worth it. Won't it? The opportunity of phrase. Gerhard Frey surveyed the papers strewn across his desk. Normally covered in documents from his legal practice was a mass of newspapers accompanied by sheets of correspondence with their owners. Gerhard smirked. Under these most strong of circumstances, media magnates who had previously would have regarded the ongoing crisis as a gold mine and instead were all too eager to divest themselves of newspapers that had become little more than gilded names once they realized the same catastrophe that they intended to report on was preventing them from printing a single sheet. 
They had failed to remember that printing presses needed power to operate. Their loss was his gain, however. He just wished he had the idea himself. The man opposite him smiles. ex raised his head. His own face was reflected back at him in the mirrored sunglasses, when warped and shifted by the lenses. He raised his glass of brandy and toast to your new media empire. Frey mirrored the gesture. I could not have done it without your assistance, of course. He took a sip of their sweet liquor. A fact I hope you will not share with anyone. My involvement naturally must remain confidential. We are permitted a great deal of leeway in our operations, but it would not do uh, to draw any attention. Naturally, I will only be too happy to take this credit. I must confess, though, I wonder what at, I wonder at your motive for all this. Reinhard Galen smiled. I have my reasons to a beautiful partnership. This is looking very good for us. Just a lot of collapsing. Civvies? Why not? No, we're looking pretty good, honestly. And the soldier's back. Welcome our boys home to fight terror with terror. Spiel attempted to eat his lunch and fail, where normally he would take an hour to polish off his meal and idly sketch a few designs that would never likely be constructed onto a napkin. Today's stream of news was too fast and he felt slightly sick. Pushing away the plate in revulsion, he consumed listening, or zoom listening, to the constant briefing that was coming from the kissing his mouth. Four such attacks on local party HQs have occurred in the past 24 hours, though only one was successful. The others were driven off either by security or party members forming into local militia, who have engaged in street and violent bouts with the rioters. Multiple fatalities have been reported from both sides. Regrettably, the Gao of Franken is not so lucky. Before the Orpo performed a counter assault upon the building, the rioters succeeded in dragging him out, mutilating him in. Kissinger's lip curled into stace, hanging him from a lamppost. He required a closed casket funeral. Alba slammed his fist against a desk and barked a, barked a brief yell of impotent rage. Kissinger did his best to hide a startled jump. Is there nothing that can be done about these savages? The best response we have is some gray-haired veterans who haven't seen combat since the West Russian War beating up commies in the streets like it's 1920 while we scroll backstage to try fixing things? It is a regrettable state of affairs, mein Führer. Shabia snorted at Kissinger's unnecessary diplomacy. The Orpo have naturally taken a more hands-off approach to these militias, since they seem to be doing their jobs for them, which they in turn have taken as a license to perform their own re retaliatory attacks. There have been several firebombings and even reported lynchings in the more uh, uh, volatile areas, and I suppose the Orpo have no intention of investigating these events? To be brutally honest, Albert, I doubt they would do so if you marched down and order them to yourself. We've tried nothing, and we're all out of ideas. Oh, that's not good. Well, we have more millies. I'm not sure why we have more millies, though. Do we need these millies? Maybe. Um, as you can see, I've already gotten rid of a lot of the millies already here, so... Um, I'll be honest, I'm not really sure what to build at this point. Here, build a lot of forts. And for these guys, uh, who's at the bottom? Just max it out. Oh, we do have... A Five more army XP. Look at that, huh? The good old days. Alfred Dreger shook his hand, or shook his head, and tossed a newspaper to his desk, leaning back in his chair. Violence and more violence. Government incompetence creating leftist agitation. Student economies and Reich's banner plants attacking party HQs and being met by equally volatile Hitler Junger and off-duty soldiers led off the leash by the limp wristed officers. Terror encountered terror, both causing equal destruction. This wouldn't have happened in his days. Agitators left and right would have been swept under the Wehrmacht's wing and had some sense forced into their heads. It certainly done him good and still some discipline into the over-eager skull of his. Where was Spidel in all this, he wondered. Whilst OKW had its fair share of died in the wool Nazis, he's always maintained a smear pragmatic view of things. Him and his boys could sweep out Speer and his gang of squabbling for reformists, clear, clear, lay a clean slate for some actual change. A firm hand was what they needed, not just one that wore a swastika armband. For all he knew, these unrest would finally brought this house of cards assembled by lunatics finally tumbling down. He just hoped that the nascent revolution would not turn out to be a 180 degree turn, or 180 degree one, or indeed a 360. It's time Germany saw a non-hooked cross. Um, over here, we probably want what? Hmm, these guys are okay. We don't have that much army XP. I want to get more. I kind of doubt we'll get more, though, realistically. So, let's go with you guys and throw on another one of these. There you go. Train. And what else? Anything else here? It doesn't really look like it. No. Well. What to do, what to do. 
Nobody in the gathering room wanted to be there, not Erhard staring in the mirror at his own mistakes. Not Kissinger, expecting another massive headache with how angry the Hardliners must have felt. Not Trusko, who had half a mind to stick his foot through the door in retaliation against political dissidents in the Wehrmacht starting up again. Not Schmidt, who felt his role as Minister of Foreign Affairs now reduced as a joke while the world scrambled in fear around him. And not least the visionary architect Speer, the bedrock of this operation is fear now shakily. The five men found themselves with stiff air and even stiffer words as they stared at each other. It was Kissinger who broke the sun and ease. The main issue we should remain concerned about is Germany and the Einheit's back. Everything else is secondary. A decline in influence worldwide, Erhard grumbled, rubbing his forehead. If it makes you feel any better, Erhard, Erhard, Erhard Tresco began, giving a neutral, not very passionate look towards the Minister of the Economy. This affects both the US and Japan. I've been told by the R&D that Japan will be hit especially hard by this, so we shouldn't suffer so much as they will. Oh, but we'll suffer all right, Schmidt hunched over a number of of papers that were handed to him by Erhard, detailing how things were practically rapidly going downhill domestically. Let alone with Germany's codependence, this is a mess, he muttered. No, Herr Schmidt, I don't think so, Speer spoke, alerting Schmidt to do it to his presence, who gazed at him with curiosity and the constant aura of a subtle irritation. We need only one to do we o need only to do only do one thing at a time like this. We need only do Man, that that's proper English, but that's really awkward. Start brainstorming man, we have a right to save. Oh boy. Uh, the Four's vision. The Führer's will. The party's might. But, hey, if you're wondering about better research facilities, please go ahead. We're back to schools eventually. And now we're going to be at cutting edge research facilities. So much to do, so little time. In a single room, five men spent hours debating a thousand years. Two sides stood opposed to one another as they all had convened to two topics. The economy and the repatriation of the slaves. Speer and Erhard did not mince their words, nor did they try to hide the fact that Germany's economy was beginning to suffocate rapidly at the hands of the crisis. Though Erhard bit his tongue and hid his regrets as he passed as he had discussed measures of austerity, and most importantly, the temporary ceasing of repatriation. While Tresco stood divided, Kissinger and Schmidt made their senses clear. You would have caused a revolt by doing that, Schmidt shot a glare towards Erhard, who only looked at him with musings of disappointment in his eyes. And we would cause a revolt with our citizens if our economy crashed because we prioritized the slaves over our own. Schmidt felt himself a stop when he heard Speer speak those words, and he struggled to muster a retort. At the very least, I suggest we don't lock down the budget. We cannot let the economy stall by halting our actions. I would offer increasing expenditures. A bigger deficit means nothing if it lets us avoid negative growth, Kissinger said. Speer eyed the Minister of Economics with a renewed interest. For the first time in a long time, the aura of close cooperation between the game began to crack. Erhard spoke, perhaps we can keep the economy open for now, but when it comes to repatriation, when a cigar hit the ashtray, the sizzle felt like the loudest thing in the, in the world. Not all men can be as idealistic as you, Schmidt. A better sweet victory. Then what is Ehad? We let even more of the former slave live in squalor, giving them all the reason they need to hang us with a rope we've sold to them? Do you know what the consequences of this action will be? The biting words were perhaps what Ehad needed to hear. But it did not diminish how painfully they felt. Or painful they felt, especially coming from a man like Schmidt. I'm well aware it was his flat reply, but, and this may be a dangerous assumption to make, they'll, they know they'll need Germany in order to fully recover. Without the Zolveran, the situation in the East would be a catastrophe. We'll just have to push through no matter the cost. For the second time now, Schmidt found himself uncertain as to what to say. What could he do? An appeal to sympathy meant nothing. It could not alter the reality that, in this broken shamble of a nation, sacrifices had to be made if he ever wanted to drag Germany from its national socialist history. The color on his face still drained, however, and he still leaned back to grab a hand to his forehead and sigh. At this point, Kissinger and Chesko both disconnected themselves from the conversation, as neither wanted to rock the boat. The conclusion seemed inevitable, but you, Schmidt spoke, prompting Speer to raise an eyebrow. Well, let the die be cast. Let's see what happens next. With a relief sigh, Speer looked towards the group, but kept an eye towards Schmidt of them all. Schmidt was doubly uh, as invested as the rest of the three combined, so much so that it was as if a piece of him was directly tied to the fate of his slaves, and that it would live and die with him. And it was already the biggest pain in the gang as it stood. When Speer spoke next, Schmidt shot him a glare that seemed almost visceral in its reaction, but subdued to the point where it was as if he tried to hide it. The matter is resolved, the repatriation will be stopped. Oh crap. Oh crap. The wheels turn. The present is nothing but the egg from which the future shall hatch, no matter what it may be. Oh, what does that mean? I know cr things are going on right now, but oh, what, what does that mean? We can bribe enemies. I'm not sure with what, but we'll, we can bribe them. We have how much of a uh, anyone percent? Not too bad. Um, what's next? Volksbund, Vox Architect, Cla crossing the Black Rubicon. By now, almost everyone felt withdrawn from the conversation at hand. At the very least, the worst was out of the way. They had come to a conclusion on how to stop the worst of Germany's bleeding wounds. Even it resulted in disgruntlement from Schmidt and less so from Kissinger and Trusko. Now they had moved on to the other matters. This time, Erhard took the stand, but against the Führer, not with them. 
They might not like the fact that we've stopped the repatriation, but at the very least, we can try to show that the Einheit's Pact, or more accurately speaking, the Zolvran, isn't just there to ravage Eastern Europe and exploit it to its fullest extent. They might not have much of an economy, true, but their sheer collective size and manpower pool is useful for the sake of keeping our numbers afloat. Even though Ahad spoke with confidence, he still found himself frowning and let a quiet sigh when Speer shook his head. No, Ahad. That's just going back to the secular argument. Germany comes first. Anything else would only lead to outrage and stability in our home territory, and the East is already unhappy. We don't need that anger to spread here too, after all, we are the architects of Europe's future, and every good plan starts with criticism. He could feel Schmidt's burning gaze even if he couldn't see it in the moment. Instead, we can reach out to the rest of the world and craft a more humane image of Germany. To some extent, I assume it'd appease both you and the NSDAP and it helped kick our economy back again. Then again, he had wondered. Was that even necessary? It was not as risky as trying to pull the Zolfrein together, true, but it was very possible that whatever t they attempted to pull the grass towards would just deny them, and it all be for naught. There was always an option of going for towards the party, which would most certainly launch a mass propaganda campaign just as they always would. As far as he knew it worked, and during a time like this, he had already stuck the flames of Germany's non-Aryan allies, so this would, this move would be yet another candle lit up. Still, it did mean working with more unsavory kinds of national socialists. The gang can surely figure this out. The Fuhrer knows best. It would be foolish to not use uh, tools such as the NSAP. So I, I do want to do the definitely conservative route. So the middle route is going to like balance. It's like some reformists, some conservative. But for this campaign, we're going to go the for the game force vision. Everyone about that, please go ahead. And my friends, we shall conclude this episode with the Energy Sharing Gazette. Energy Sharing Gazette, the law for the insurance of energy supplies, the latest creation by the gang and the preferred economists. Rapidly put together to face a growing crisis, it shall be the backbone of a response to the economic collapse that we face today. It's quite ironic that the name is such a mouthful to say, for it will certainly simplify the gang's efforts in recovering and replenishing the German economy. In short, the law will effectively give the gang the power to mandate any means they see as unnecessary to combat the crisis. Such measures are certainly a great expansion of the gang's power and will certainly ruffle conservative feathers, but with the combined weight of Kissinger and Speer pushing it through the Volkshalle. We should have no trouble passing it into the books. Soon we can truly get back to working to fix this mess. But if you enjoyed today's long, kind of crazy episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow when we'll see if everything really does collapse. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.